This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Okay, we are getting near the end of our study in the book of Revelation. We come to uh, Revelation chapter 21, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to go back to verse 2 and start there. Read with me verse 2 and 3. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. The difficulty in uh, helping you to see what this section of Scripture teaches is the possible prejudice that you might carry into these verses. And all of the teaching that you may have been exposed to that tells you that what this is talking about is um, not the church, but our home in eternity. What these verses talk about are consistent with what the scriptures talk about in Jesus' coming kingdom in the church that's been established in Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 1 and following, which is Christ's spiritual kingdom. We're using these terms as the rest of the Bible uses these terms. We're not inserting any tradition into it. And uh, let, me, let me illustrate it to you this way. In, in the, the Bible, in the, in the book of Revelation, the holy city is a reference to the church. New Jerusalem is a reference to the church. The bride of Christ is a reference to the church. The tabernacle of God is a reference to the church. All of these references in these first two verses then do, do not suddenly change into something that refers to our eternal home in heaven. I hope you can see that as we go through this. I think it'll, it'll, uh, the, the pieces of this puzzle will fall together quite nicely for you if, you if you keep your mind open about that. Now, as I've said through all of these, these are all uh, physical descriptions of spiritual realities. These are not things that are to be understood in a literal sense, but they are in physical terms describing for us physical beings things of great exceeding value. The, it, it's difficult since we are both spiritual beings and physical beings to, to appreciate the value of spiritual things all of the time. And so what God does is in physical terms he expresses, he explains to us the value of those spiritual things. And that's what this is all about here. We know that we're talking about <clears throat> the church because 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16, Paul says, For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Paul applies this to the church as he writes to the church. And so we know that the tabernacle of God is among men. We are, the church is, the temple of God on earth. And he says in Revelation 21 and verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. This passage is always being applied to our eternal home in heaven. And while it may be true that these characteristics exist in heaven, what this passage is teaching us is the spiritual realities that exist today in the Lord's church. And the easiest way to see that is to look at the end of the verse, the first things have passed away, which has reference to the law of Moses. Isaiah chapter 25, verses 7 and 8 prophesies, and on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over the peoples, even the veil which is stretched over the nations. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord will wipe 
tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Isaiah is telling us what is in, in, in advance of Christ's first coming, what's going to happen when Christ brings his kingdom to earth. We know that Christ brought his kingdom to earth when he came the first time. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And so Isaiah's prophecy has to do with the spiritual realities that will, will exist when Christ comes. And those are spiritual realities that we are blessed with today. At the same time that his kingdom was coming and that God would wipe away the tears of sorrow for sin because they could not receive forgiveness of sins under the old law without the blood of Christ, the veil would be removed, Isaiah's prophecy says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 through 16 tells us when that veil was removed, Paul said, but their minds were hardened, for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this very day, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their heart, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So if we understand uh, Isaiah's prophecy properly, that veil would be removed at the same time, and that veil is removed in Christ. Isaiah said, Isaiah 25 and verse 9, but it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So the, the same things that Isaiah was prophesying about would come true when salvation came, and we all know when salvation came through Jesus Christ. Here's some more prophecy. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. Throughout the book of Revelation, we've seen that the sun and the moon represent spiritual influences. Here, uh, Isaiah says, when that kingdom comes, when that... Uh, veil is removed, then the Lord will be your everlasting light. The book of Revelation tells us that in the church, the Lord is the light. Isaiah 65 and verse 19 says, I will rejoice, I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people, and there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the, and the sound of crying. The mourning for sin was to cease, Isaiah tells us, when Christ comes the first time. Now, the, the problem with this is many people are trying to apply this in a physical way to the sorrows that we experience here upon earth. The book of Revelation tells Christians that they are going to experience sorrows while they're here upon earth during this tribulation period, the uh, the um, thousand years that the church is on earth will be a difficult time, and during that time there will be sorrows, but not for sins. That's what he has reference to here. And when we come back in just a second, we'll look at verse 5. Okay, the, the, he's making all things new, and that's a reference to the old law and the new law. In verse 5 he says, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these th words are faithful and true. Um, Jesus is the one who is faithful and true. The things that are new are the, uh, the things that are contained in the law of Christ as opposed to the law of Moses. It's the new law that changes man's relationship to God. It's the old law that was the law of Moses that did not allow for uh, forgiveness of sins. And so verse 5 is telling us that those first things refer to the law of Moses. The all things new refer to the law of Christ. There's a new relationship that we have to God in the law of Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 helps us to see that. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. 
uh, as you know, under the old law, you could not pray to God directly. You had to go through the high priest. You had to go uh, to the tabernacle, to the temple, talk to the high priest. He would intercede for you. But here, what the Hebrew writer tells us is there's this new way that God has inaugurated for our access to him. We stand before his throne based upon the blood of Christ. Verse 6, he says, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Again, this must be telling us something about the gospel story rather than something about our eternal abode because this would be saying it would be necessary for someone to go to heaven to drink of the water of life without cost, which would be impossible if, um, if the end of time occurs, then a person's fate is sealed and they wouldn't have access to the water of life without cost. What he's telling us in verse 6 is the whole scheme of things. God has finished the whole scheme of things and set into motion the way that man may have access to the water of life without cost. Christ is that source of water. The water is the gospel. Remember Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That's the water that he's talking about that is flowing out of the church. In John 7 and verse uh, 37, Jesus said, Now on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now you see, that, that would be impossible to do if that water was found only in heaven, but it's found in the spiritual heavenly places in the church. John 19, verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And behold, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What Revelation is telling us is that God completed his plan. The last things are the things that he put together in, in uh, the law of Moses. The, the things that are new are the is the new relationship that we have to Christ, the forgiveness of sins. And when Christ died, that sealed those things. He says then in verse 7, He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. We overcome the world of sin when we are washed in the blood of Christ. Now look at this graph. We'll go all the way back to the second chapter in the book of Revelation where we began. In Revelation 2 and verse 7, the scripture says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And we've now looked at this little graph that comes from my good friend Lonnie Woodruff many, many times in this series of programs. And uh, this little graph will become even um, more clear to you as we continue on in this chapter and the next. But you, you see... You see how nicely uh, the book of Revelation ties itself together. All mankind is in bondage to sin. Whether, whether mankind recognizes that or not, they are. What separates us in our, in our relationship to God is sin. And we overcome that world of sin by the blood of Christ. When we overcome that sin, the book of Revelation tells us, we then are granted access to the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It takes us back to, to the Garden of Eden. The church is God's Garden of Eden, God's paradise on earth, where we have access to the tree of life, which we'll talk about a little bit more in, uh, in coming episodes, representative of Christ, and the water that flows from the throne of God, which is the gospel-saving message. We overcome, we know, 1 John 5, verses 3 through 5, when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, when we have faith in Him, when we are born again by baptism, we overcome this world of sin that we live in. And, and Revelation teaches us how to overcome the world of sin. The world lives in spiritual darkness. The church walks in the light. We overcome by the blood of Christ. And then verse 8 tells us, Revelation 21 and 8. 
but for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In the book of Revelation, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, the liars have reference to those that twist God's word. There are those who uh, uh, commit immoral um, acts against God. It's spiritual immorality to teach something other than what the scriptures teach. There are those who are sorcerers when it comes to the word of God, who manipulate the word of God um, quite nicely to accomplish their purposes, not to accomplish God's purposes, but to accomplish their purposes. They are idolaters in the sense that they establish for themselves uh, like the uh, um, uh, those who worship their religious leaders, those who worship those things that the religious leaders tell them to worship, materialism in many senses, uh, they are the idolaters. There are the liars, the false prophets, those who, again, twist God's word. They believe, uh, they're, they're unbelieving, the scripture tells us. And here he tells us that their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In other words, not everybody who teaches the Bible is going to go to heaven. It's only those who teach the truth of what the scriptures teach. All others go into the second death. Revelation 20 and verse 6 says, Over these the second death has no power. Those who have gone through the first resurrection and that second death, the lake of fire, is eternal separation from God. The last enemy that we overcome will be death, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6. And that takes us into a new chapter, a new section, and uh, we will begin that when we come back in just a minute. At scripturesay.com, you'll find a full library of Bible studies, online books, articles, even Spanish material. You'll even find downloadable MP3 files of the McCoy family singers singing a cappella music. Whatever you need in Bible study materials, you're sure to find it at scripturesay.com. Visit scripturesay.com today. I said just before the break that we're going into a new chapter. We're not going into a new chapter. We're going into a new section. And this is really, this is uh, the final section of the book of Revelation. And this section pulls together all of these images and symbols that we've been looking at in the last couple of chapters. Um, and uh, I'm sure you're going to be able to see this uh, and the application that we need to make uh, clearly as we go through this. So let me read verse 9 and following, and then we'll go back and look. Uh, we'll, we'll pull this apart. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of, seven of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and the names were written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east and gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. John says that he heard the angel say to him, come here I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb, in verse 9. And the, the thing that I need to remind you again of is context, context, context. We have looked at the bride, the wife of the Lamb, throughout this series, and we've applied that symbolism to the church. I don't know anybody that really misses that. The New Testament uh, reaffirms to us in a number of places 
that uh, the church is the bride of Christ. You see that, you understand that. So if verse 9 uh, is talking about the church, and it is, then the rest of this section is talking about the church. It's a description, it's some kind of symbolic description of the church and its value. It's some kind of symbolic description of the church and what it does in this world. And it's not a description of our eternal home. Now, as you've heard me say before, some of the characteristics of the church are going to be translated into all eternity. Some of the things that are true of this spiritual relationship to God here and now will be true in eternity. But that's not what John wants us to see here. What he wants us to see here is the great significant value that God has placed upon his church. So when, when Revelation 21, 9 says, come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb, then that's what he's talking about. It's easy, isn't it, if you, if you don't cloud it up with some tradition. Next, he says, <clears throat> well, let me show you a couple of verses real quickly that help us to see that we know we're talking about uh, the church. Revelation 21, verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. We know that's speaking about the church because Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 says that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. So he's talking about the church in that verse. He says in Revelation 21 and verse 24 that the nations are going to walk by the light. We know that's a reference to the church because the church is the platform for the light in the world and Christians walk by the light in the world. We know he's talking about the church. Revelation 21 and verse 25 tells us in the daytime there will be no night there and the, the night is talking about the separation from God because of sin and the gates are always going to be open. He's talking about the church there. In Revelation 21 and verse 27 he says nothing unclean or anyone who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We know that the Lamb's Book of Life is a reference to the church, and we know that no one who is unclean is in the church in the sense that uh, they are washed in the blood of the Lamb as they enter into the church. Revelation 21 and, uh, 22 and verse 1 says that he shows me the river of the water of life, clear, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. And in, verse tw in chapter 22 and verse 17 he says, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take of the water of life without cost. Now, if that was a reference to eternity in heaven, then it would be impossible to fulfill Revelation 22 and verse 17 to come into heaven to take of the water of life without cost if you're thirsty for spiritual things. So we know that Revelation 22 and verse 1 is talking about our existence in the spiritual realm. In Revelation 22 and verse 2, he says, in the middle of the street on either side was the tree of life. We know that that tree of life is in the Lord's church, bearing 12 different kinds of fruit um, every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. We know that the entrance into the church comes as a result of those who wash their robes so that they may have access to the tree of life. Revelation 22 and verse 14 tells us. That takes us back to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14, where those who come out of the great tribulation wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. So you see how all of this is being pulled together to point to the church. The warning that comes to us in Revelation 22 and verse 19, if anyone takes away from these words, God will take away his part from the tree of life, which is in the holy city. So that holy city is a reference to the church. And that's where we will pick up when we get together next week in our study of the book of Revelation. I hope these lessons have been helpful to you. If you need more on my notes, go to scripturesay.com. All of these notes are found there, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.